Johnson & Wales University and the Distinguished Visiting Chef Committee proudly present the Distinguished Visiting Chef Series, an educational resource and video reference library for culinary students and professionals. Today's guest, Chef Barbara Lynch. Listen, uh, my name is Adam Joseph. I'm the director of culinary events. I thank you all for coming out. Uh, I'm going to assure you a very, very wonderful demonstration here today. Um, I'd like to welcome um, our vice president of student affairs, Dr. Jeffrey Sinise, and our university provost, Dr. Vera Gall. This demonstration um, is all being made possible by our Dean of College of Culinary Arts, Chef Kevin Duffy. Dean, Dean Kevin Duffy. So before we get started, uh, I would like everybody to just stop for a second, be very quiet and very still for 10 seconds. Because what we're going to have today is something that you need to have your minds clear for, your spirits clear for, and your souls clear for, because it's going to be so invigorating. Um, I had the opportunity of spending a couple of evenings with uh, Chef uh, the past couple of days, and uh, she's going to bring a lot to you. Uh, what I'm going to sort of start this off by saying uh, and reading to you uh, is according to the American Marketing Association defines brand as a name term, design, symbol, or any other feature that identifies one seller's good or services as distinct from those of other sellers. A brand may identify one item, a family of items, or all items of that seller. So what you're going to see right now is a brand. And how many people know of the brand Barbara Lynch? Say something about the brand Barbara Lynch. Um, she won the James Beard Award. Okay, who else? Being from Boston, she's a role model to me. Okay, role model. Mr. Gutman? Uh, my daughter's favorite restaurant is Number 9 Park. One of Chef Lynch's, there we go, all right, all right. Well listen, I'm not gonna steal Chef Lynch's thunder, I want her to tell you all about her story. Um, one of the most dynamic stories I've heard, um, very inspirational, I want you guys again, Clear your minds, clear your souls, and get ready for this. Please help me in welcoming Chef Barbara Lynch. Wow, I'm nervous. How's it going? How are you? Um, I'm glad your daughter likes number nine. Has she? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, actually, Maureen, Adam, Kevin, Chef Stanley. Uh, for getting me here. Um, I know Maureen's worked on me for a while. Because I'm generally, I'm really shy, but um, um, I actually love what I do. So um, cooking to me is like 
I don't know. I mean, I live and breathe it. How many of you, who, who wants to own a restaurant? Great. Who wants to have five restaurants? <laughs> who wants to be on the Food Network? Cool. One, only one, uh, two? Great. I'm so glad to see that because um, I think being a chef is really, um, you know, it's a craft, actually. It's like one of those jobs that you have to know everything. You have to know uh, how, to, how, to, how does the grease trap work? How, do, how long does it take you to wash dishes? You know, you have to master that craft. Um, I've been doing this for 25 years. I have nine restaurants now. I have a catering company as well. I have a cooking store called uh, Cookbook Store slash Cooking Demonstration um, called Stir. Um, and when I started cooking, um, God knows why I'm here, because I, I, I never went to culinary school. You guys, you're so lucky you're here. You're, you're in school to learn, to be disciplined, to learn from masters. Um, I, I didn't have that. I had that little, like, you know, work in restaurants, get screamed at, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I had to become a tough person. You know, I had to be that, especially a, a girl on the line with about 10 guys. I had, to, I had to change in the same room, um, but um, I loved every minute of it. I loved being on the line. I loved the pressure. I loved it when I mastered my dish and said, don't touch my saute pan or I'll kill you. Don't flip my fish or I'll kill you. Um, I loved when I could meet my, my guys in the window and I'd, I'd have my dish up there first and say, come on, come on. Um, and that's what I'm talking about, like the craft, the passion, the drive. You have to have all of that to succeed. First, you have to love food and you have to love cooking. I don't mean you need to be a fanatic about food because I have friends who love food more than I love food. I actually love the cooking part of it. I love that you can take potatoes and flour and an egg and make a dough. Um, so that's, uh, I, and I, I really would love a lot of questions from you um, because I'm here only for two hours and you know, you got my time right here. Um, so, anybody have a question before I start? I have a question. Sure. Um, will you explain to them how you got from where you grew up into owning nine restaurants in this huge Should I? Boston? Should I tell you? I was a bookie in high school. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Born and raised in South Boston. Uh, seven brothers and sisters. Uh, my father died a month before I was born, so I never met him. Um, my mother um, worked an awful lot of jobs, uh, and one of them was actually the St. Patolf Club, where Stan and I have a, a mutual friend, um, had a mutual friend, Mario Bonello. But before I get there, um, uh, I, I wasn't really a good student, basically. Like, I, 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 I didn't, I needed to have visual. I needed to be visual. So my, and also, in Boston, when I was, Going to high school, um, we went through this thing called forced busing, which was an integration. All the white students from South Boston and Charlestown uh, had to go over to Roxbury, and all the black students had to come to South Boston. So school back then was a disaster. Lots of fighting, um, lots of crap going on. The blessing is I had um, a home economics program, which they don't have anymore in schools. Um, so the only way I would stay in school is if they allowed me to take cooking for four years. That's the only reason I stayed in school. Um, I actually never graduated high school. Um, not, you know, not proud of it, but um, it was just that one of those things, it was just one of those times where it just wasn't going to work for me. Um, but I knew at age 12 I wanted to cook. So I knew, I, I talked myself into being a chef at age 12. I um, also uh, would cut out of school quite early and then get into all kinds of trouble. I, I was a bookie in high school, believe me, I was. And I, I, I took lots of risks and I wouldn't even call the, the races in and I'd take the money and I'd go buy some clothes or you know, whatever. Um, so I, I was that inner city kid who grew up in a project and, and, and um, I, but I had, I had wonderful morals. I, my mother was such a hard worker that that's how I learned how to, um, you know, be with a team and lead a team. Had, yeah, can you imagine raising seven kids by yourself? I can't. Um, so 
My mother also worked at the St. Vitolf Club where um, Stanley uh, was a chef with Mario Benello who was a Lascaufier chef. So we were start, starting to talk about Lascaufier. And at age 14, um, I was just seeing food that I've never seen before, like sweetbreads under a bell. Um, you know, I, I was like, wow, this guy is making people happy with food. This is amazing. This is what I want to do. And so that's actually how I started. And um, I, I never cooked at the St. Patolf Club, but I was a server. And then um, I, I left there and uh, I, oh God, I mean, I worked on the docks. I, I worked everywhere. But um, I decided to leave the vineyard. I mean, leave the St. Patolf Club and go to Martha's Vineyard. I got a job on a boat, you know, long story, but fun story. Uh, but that was my first cooking job. And it was on a boat, 175 foot motor vessel. Um, it, it was great, but it was just steak and lobster. I, I, knew, I didn't know how to, ah, God, that was it. I didn't even know how to butcher a t beef tenderloin. So I went to the library, got as many cookbooks as I could get, and then I stayed in my room, and I read and read and read and read. Um, how to butcher beef, how to, how to uh, cook and kill lobsters, um, how to make uh, zabayon sauce. I didn't even know how to, what, what? It's, I, I was calling a Zamponi. When I called Mario for the, <laughs> I'm like, Mario, how did you make that Zamponi sauce? And he's like, oh God, you know? Um, but I read so much um, that that is actually how I started to cook. My first uh, book I loved, um, I would read from well, one point of Andrew Square to Cambridge. It was like a good half an hour train ride. Foods of Italy by, um, uh, Waverly Root was the book, and it had no photos. It just talked about the culture and food in each region. So my, I must have read that like three times, and by the time I, my first trip into Italy, it was amazing because everything that I read, I would get off the train in Bologna and I'd go have uh, tortellini and brodo or um, palma prosciutto. I'd go and get some prosciutto. And so then everything started to make sense to me. Um, so I was lucky enough when I worked in a restaurant in Cambridge called Michaela's, a girl next to me on Garmage, her mom had a house in Italy. I mean, I never even left Southie. Now I'm gonna go to Italy, okay? Uh, no, I had no money. I had to borrow a friend's credit card. Uh, I had a passport. Um, I thought when I got to Italy that everything would be in English. Wow, what a surprise. Uh, so it was like, just a, like, you know, again, I was, what, 24? Eye-opening experience. And I, I, I devoured every minute of Italy. I got to work with um, a cab driver's wife. I got to work on a farm um, where um, this woman, Mita, taught me how to make pasta. Uh, she taught me how to, you know, basil, rabbits, how to skin a rabbit, et cetera, et cetera. So that was amazing. Um, so I mastered Italian. Uh, I, I actually was just basically an Italian chef for 10, 10 years, and then, um, I decided, I, I, I don't know where I got the balls, basically, but I was ready for my own restaurant. And um, I found uh, Nine Park on uh, Beacon Hill Street. It's on Park Street, right in front of the State House. Um, and I didn't want to do Italian, just Italian, so I decided I wanted to do um, French and Italian. Uh, I had a lot of cookbooks, but they were all in French, so I took my um, dictionary and I translated a lot of the stuff that I wanted to learn. And then I went to France and I ate probably at eight Michelin star restaurants for lunch. And um, I still remember the food I had at Taivant. I remember the, the lamb from the Pyrenees Mountains. I remember the rabbit pativier and exactly how the flavors I wanted. Um, I ate at La Peche and that was just amazing. Ducasse was amazing, and I, and, you know, I loved it. How I felt afterwards, like when you had the desserts or the menu D's coming out, and then you, you know, got to have uh, great champagnes, burgun uh, ports afterwards, and you know that feeling of satiation when you leave, you're like, oh my god, it was amazing. Um, so I set a goal at that time that that's where I want to be. I wanted to be Elaine Ducasse, or I wanted to be Joelle Rubichon. Um, so I opened Nine Park, um, which is basically a French and Italian restaurant. That was 14 years ago. I just hit my goal. I, I just uh, opened Montan, which is my f fine dining restaurant, a little fancier than number nine. Um, uh, we opened it a year and a half ago, and um, you know what? I'm happy to be Barbara Lynch now. I, I don't need to be Joelle Rubichon, you know? <laughs> I, 
I, I, I guess I'm just trying to make a point. Like, you know, you can do anything you want. You just talk yourself into it. Just do it, especially if you're passionate. Don't worry about money. Oh my God, in my room, I would read, do what you love, money will follow. I read that like 10 times. Thank God I didn't end up milking cows for a living. But um, I, I, I'm doing what I love, and money, w money will follow. I mean, you know, you don't need nine restaurants, but it's not a bad idea. <laughs> Um, and, and you know, there's lots of things. When you first go and you want to have a restaurant, you know what? Wish, I wish I knew way back when. Buy the property. Don't. Uh, I don't own any of my um, my res my the the property where my restaurants are. So that, a good little decision would be to sort of don't worry about like the kitchen equipment and you know all of that. You know, just really think about what you're doing and also have a plan. Have a vision. What do you want? Um, what is your vision? Uh, you know, I went all Italian for, for 10 years and I stuck to that. Then I, 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 I mastered the French or I wanted to, still haven't, um, but it's just a lot more technique and, um, you know, and, uh, but those are the two things that I stayed with. I didn't go all over the lot. Like I didn't want to learn, you know, uh, when I have a day off, I, I love um, Thai food, so I make some Thai food, but I don't, I don't know that. I didn't. I didn't want to master that. So that is really important to stick to your vision, and 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 tunnel vision for me works tremendous. I don't care who, what else is going on around me, or what chef is doing this, or what is that, because I hate trends as well. Because I'm in this business for the rest of my life, and it's going to have to be important. Um, and, and you need to know where you want to be, what city you want to be in, and what what does a city need. And always think about your community too. So. Those are just my little takes on, on life. Any questions? No, okay. Um, this first dish is butter soup, uh, which um, I, I got to uh, ask to make a dish at the James Beard Awards like two years ago. Um, and it was all women chefs and we were paired up with farmers. And so it was in March and there's not a lot out there in terms of produce in March. Um, so the one farmer I do have is Diane St. Clair, and she um, makes my butter for me. I have three cows in Orwell, Vermont, a, Ho a Hopi, Babette, and Bella. <laughs> um, and this, um, this is not her butter, but when you see her butter, um, it's 87% um, butter fat, so it's really bright orange. Um, and, and the cows, they eat wild flowers and, and hops, and you know, so when she starts milking in September again, that butter is amazing, amazing. And she, she has like, she makes butter like in a little laundry room pretty much. Um, and she only sells it to myself and Thomas Keller. She, Tom has, uh, Thomas has a cow called Keller. Um, I don't know how I ended up with three and he's only got one, but uh, it's an amazing place and the butter's amazing. So here's my uh, take on butter soup. Uh, it's just a uh, Bermonte basically, so about a tablespoon of water. And um, you're just gonna whisk in the butter. So the butter soup is um, basically butter and shellfish, caviar, and um, a honey emulsion as well. Somebody talk. You guys are making me nervous. Talk. Uh, right now, it's only at Nine Park. But um, I'm pretty sure I'm going to start um, getting it um, for Montana as well. The thing is, um, we don't have a, a supplier that delivers from Vermont. So we're just starting to uh, work with a new company called Provisions. And hopefully, um, when they start, I'll start using more butter and um, buttermilk from her. Her, her buttermilk is amazing. Um, so that, that's kind of what I want. Uh, has anybody been up to Vermont lately? No? Are you, is anybody from Boston besides? Okay, cool. You have a lot of farmers that you work with? 
Yeah, I do. Um, well, I have my, my main uh, produce is uh, Chris Kurth from Sienna Farms in Sudbury, Massachusetts. Uh, he's married to Anna Sorthorn from Oleana, and he has an amazing farm. Um, I can't tell you, like, you eat his carrots and you, you want to die. They're so good. The broccoli's amazing. Um, his greens are amazing. The silvetta, the arugula, it's so peppery. Crinkle crust, crinkle crust yeah. The marijuana's really, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, now you're alive. Awesome. Um, this is Chris Henry, and he's my um, chef for Nine at Home, but he does a lot. He, he's also like my... He, he gets to come with me right. a lot. <laughs> um, and we, but it's a basically out of my 250 employees, I would say Chris and I work the closest because I actually do work with him on catering. People are surprised when I show up at their house and they don't know <laughs> that I'm there. Um, and we design menus and, and then, uh, you know, especially when I'm traveling and have to do this kind of stuff, this is what he does. So basically, that yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. Um, there's your butter, there's the soup, um, and then the honey emulsion is basically um, milk and honey already in here, uh, and then we're just going to uh, froth it with a hand blender, and we can just poach the, so the, the shellfish is already um, cooked, so lobsters, um, Basically seven minutes I usually do for the claws, four minutes for the tail. I, I take them apart and do it. Uh, mussels, as soon as they open, take them out. Clams, the same. Uh, and then you're just gonna slowly um, bring them back in, up to temperature um, in your butter uh, bermonte, basically. Uh, yep, salt, pepper, and I'm gonna add um, a splash of uh, lemon juice just to, just to bring it alive. Um, and then the honey and the milk, slightly warmed. And I always add an egg yolk um, because it helps froth it. I mean, you, mean you, you can also use soy lecithin as well, but... Um, egg yolk works perfect. And I'm not like a foam girl either. I, I just recently did a dinner with four of my uh, then they were like my sous chefs, and now Nemo, who used to work for me at Nine Park, owns Cook and Brown here in Rhode Island. Uh, my other chef, Baz, is a chef at Fifth Floor in San Francisco. Um, Ed Cotton was on Top Chef. Did you? In, uh, I think he won. No, he was going to win. He was going to win. He was the guy who wore a dress one day. Did you? Anybody see that? He's so funny. He's going to open a restaurant in Queens. Um, and this other, one of my sous chefs, Nikolai, I got him to work in Spain, so he, he spent some time with Arzac. And um, man, that kid, all he does now, I, like, when I, I went to go and help them at the James Beard house about a month ago, and they're all using those canisters. I was like, oh no, everything has foam on it. Ugh. So, um, hold on one second. Um, basically, you're gonna put your shellfish right in the center. You can't eat a big bowl of this, by the way. So this is um, actually um, on the menu at Montan. I mean, it's not on the menu, but for VIPs or anybody who knows about the butter soup, we usually send it out as, a, as an amuse, as a starter. Thanks. Um, tons of caviar. It's a good idea. And then um, the honey emulsion. So if you can imagine like milk, butter, honey, uh, caviar, nice and salty. It's uh, it's great to try. Um, so that's the butter soup. Thanks. 
Um, any questions on that one? No? Yeah. Did you say um, the butter that you get is bright orange? Yeah. Does that like alter the color of the soup? Oh my god, the soup is amazing when you see that. Yeah, it's like, um, it's like the color of a sunflower. And as, as the season goes, I mean, so September, October, November, by, by January, the butter's a little not as bright, but because uh, then they're starting to eat, um, you know, hay or dried flowers. But no, it's, it's, a really, it's a really amazing butter. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah? What inspired me to create this dish? Yeah. Oh, um, the inspiration was I needed to work with a farmer, and that was the only farmer I had. Um, so um, I was like, oh God, what am I going to make with butter, right? I don't want to make a tart. I don't want to do that. I want to make butter soup. And I think um, when, I, when I served this at the James Beard um, party, uh, Gabrielle Hamilton must have ate about a pound of butter. <laughs> Uh, Danny Meyer's wife had about a pound of butter, and uh, Joelle Rubichon's chef de cuisine was, where'd you get the butter? So, um, you know, it might sound crazy, but it, it, it's, it's just one of those things. If you, if you, if you think it's going to work, try it. If it in, but you know what? If, it, if you try it and it works, brilliant. You're going to always have to tweak it. But, like, if you're trying to cook a dish and it, it's like your fifth time, forget it, because it's just not going to work. Just, and then think about it again, or draw it, and then s draw it on paper and see what you want. But also remember textures, and, and there's not a lot in there, right? So that's, there's not a lot in there at all. You don't need to manipulate food or products if you have great products. I do agree. I do think it's a great way to showcase the butter. Yeah, thank you. The, the French might not like it, because it's not like a sauce. French or something. Who? Lisa. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stanley, okay. Um, so, uh, he, uh, Stan would love for me to mention Leah Linster, um, who I am, I, I'm actually in a group called Les Mer Cuisinaire, where I cook with um, a bunch of uh, European women chefs um, to actually promote women in the kitchen. One of them is Leah Linster from Germany. Um, who was the only woman to win the Bocuse d'Or, the only woman to win the, the Bocuse. I don't think many women compete in that, right? Right. And, and uh, Bocuse said... Oh, oh, what he, oh yeah, women uh, belong. belong in the bedroom. Could you imagine? <laughs> Not in the kitchen. But That's when I decided I don't want to be Joelle Rubichon. He had to apologize. He should have, yeah. Jeez, I'm surprised she didn't knock him out. She's awesome. <laughs> She's like this big German tough woman. I love her. Uh, uh, but La Mer Cuisinaire, um, uh, when I get to that, I want to talk about the chicken because I actually did this in uh, Courchevel with, my, with the girls, which is Elena Arzak, Anna-Sophie Pick, Leah Linster, Christine Ferber. Do you know Christine Ferber? I love her. She's a, she just makes jellies and jams, and she's got a little shop in Alsace. Oh my god, but it's the best. Uh, you should try and get her book if anybody likes to make jellies and jams. It's, uh, it's called Moss Comfortures. Um, and Alenda Rose um, and Ariane Daguen from D'Artagnan. So this, that's a little group, and we we, we go over there, and I was like, oh my God. It used to take a year off my life because I was so nervous. Like, I think French women are harder to cook with than French men, because I don't say anything. Uh, I was pregnant, I was like six months pregnant in uh, La Berge de Lille. That's where I, 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 I cooked, and that was a nightmare, because I was six months pregnant. I wasn't used to cryo or sous vide but I thought I'd give it a try. Um, and so we actually, Put, you know, we, we had beautiful baby vegetables and we uh, blanched and cryovacked, but we actually put Brussels sprouts in it and that just f***ed it all up. It was all gray. It looked like boil in a bag. And I, I remember like Elena Arzak going, oh, do you sous vide much? I'm like, no, never. But, uh, you know, I had to do it all over. I had to like beg them for lobsters. I needed to do it all over again because it was gray. And I talk about being an embarrassed moment. I was like, oh my God. I'm horrible, but anyway, I got over it. 
Um, and, and, and the dish came out good. But I, love, I loved working in that, that kitchen. Any other questions? No. So the next dish is um, cauliflower uh, chauffeur, which, um, you know, I don't know about you, but I love cauliflower, and I just sometimes think it's that underutilized um, vegetable. So I, I basically um, put it, it's shallots, butter, and cauliflower. A little bit of butter. You want to sweat it out. You want to cook it for about seven minutes and then um, until it's tender. So make sure when you cut the cauliflower, um, cut it around the, the core and cut it all the same size and it, and it cooks um, quicker. Where's the cartouche? You going to do it? Um, and then I showed them a little trick yesterday. I know for me, when I'm in the restaurant, I don't know what happens to all my lids like on the pots, but I can never find them when I want them. So there's a little trick called uh, uh, cartouche, which is you know, just a lid if you don't have, um, you know, you kind of want some steam in there. Bas yeah, it's <laughs> so it's basically that. So if you're sort of braising stuff in a big pot and you need a, a cover, it's a little large, but do you get the point? Yep. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Um, so then I would puree it through the Vitamix, the Vita Prep, um, and uh, it's just basically cauliflower puree. It also has a little bit of heavy cream in it. Um, so you want to blend it till it's nice and smooth, and then I actually put it through a chinois. Um, and um, I, f I add um, fresh grated horseradish into it. And then you're all familiar with gelatin, right? Gelatin? OK, great. So um, this, you just bloom it, basically. I think it's usually, uh, I usually do like seven sheets to one, one quart. Um, and it, it, it um, just sort of thickens it up. Um, oh, what I do is, hold on. I'm going to add the gelatin to this, and then we're going to set it in the soap pats and then freeze them because they're easier to pop out when they're frozen. This, if you don't have gelatin, like if you're cooking this at home and you don't have gelatin at home, it's, it really makes a really good cauliflower soup. This is also gets a celery sauce, which is um, basically uh, celery slowly, uh, slowly cooked and then pureed in the blender as well. Um, and that is um, basically it. In, uh, we're going to top it with some caviar and brunoise celery, salt and pepper, and celery cream. Okay. Why is it called a celery? Hot and cold. Does a celery why? It's just prepared hot it's, and served cold. it's prepared hot and then served cold. Uh, I I learned the, the basics, the classics, and um, in both cuisines, in Italian and French, um, and I just think that you can take you know you can um, sort of take the classics and make into what you want, whatever dish you want. Um, so I, I guess that's that's kind of the way I like to do it. Yeah. 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 And to let the beef Wellington is covered as well. The yeah, I use, I do salmon as well covered yeah. in it. Um, so, yeah, old 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 good standard classics, but just twist them if you want. Don't go crazy, but you can you can change. <laughs> so the gelatin is bloomed, and uh, you strain out the water. And then you add it to your hot cauliflower. And then once it's all dissolved, um, you can set your molds.
How is it? Yeah? Cool. Um, so basically, set your molds. Like, if you don't have this, you can use, uh, you, you can also do this like in, as a terrine shape kind of thing, however you want. It's just easier for us to do it that way. Then I'd um, pop that in the freezer and then um, let them freeze overnight. Pull them out an hour and a half before you're going to serve them. So pop them out, keep them on a sheet tray, and then plate from there. Uh, Huh? Uh, can I get your opinion on molecular gastronomy? Repeat the question. Uh, he wants to get my take on molecular gastronomy. Hmm. I like it, but I don't know it. Um, it's very, what do you feel like? How do you like it? Huh? It's, uh, it's just really interesting. I mean, science. Uh, yeah, I, I love science, which I never knew I liked so much um, because I didn't know I actually knew what I thought I knew. And then I taught at Harvard last year, and it was, uh, it was fun, because I got to hang around with Harry McGee and talk about um, binders, pH balances, and so forth. Um, would I be a complete molecular chef? No, because I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know enough of it, and nor do I want to manipulate food that much. I don't like um, when I can taste chemicals in my mouth. I do like the idea of it, uh, but astronauts, I mean, we've been doing that forever with astronaut food, you know, um, or cheese whiz, you know, stuff like that. So when you think about it, it's, it's still, you're manipulating food to do something else. Totally, uh, um, and I'm in awe of it. Um, I don't think it's practical at all, like Ebuli e e e e e e is closed. Um, uh, you know, and I had dinner at Alinea, um, 24 courses, 24 okay courses. Like, you know, there were three that I thought were brilliant, so I, I kind of have a hard time too. Like, if you're going to be, you want to do 24 courses, they better all be brilliant. And sometimes it's just way too much for me to eat that, it, for my brain to take all that. Um, so, does that answer your question? Yeah? <coughs> Caviar? Huh? I was just going to say, when you, were, when you were there, did you feel like the food was more of an idea? You know, like it had all gelled together? What was it that did I you hated it. I mean, the food I liked, but I hated the experience because it's every three and a half minutes you were interrupted by a server. Eat it this way. Chef wants you to eat it that way. And I was like, oh my God. Plus, I hate when somebody tells me what to do. Um, <laughs> you know, it was just way too, like, even if I wanted a conversation with my husband, I, I couldn't because it was interrupted that many times. So it wasn't a good dining experience, but yes, it was, you know, a lot to take in and interesting. Oh, thanks. Any more questions? Hold on, hold on. Um, where do I get the ideas to come up with the dishes that I create? Um, ooh, inspiration, okay. Um, you know why? I think uh, I, I read a lot. I, re I read a lot of cookbooks, um, but I don't follow the recipes or, um, again, like I didn't invent food, so, but I, what I am doing is sort of layering and textures. I always believe in textures. And that, I think the beauty of cooking Italian for 10 years they um, are very, very simple in what they use. I mean, great basil, great tomatoes, great olive oil um, is key. Um, so when you start with like, the basics or some simple, simple ingredients, then you can add on a little bit here and there. I, uh, I don't know where I get, I get inspiration from everything. I'm, I love running in the woods, I love, you know, but I, if, some, if a dish comes to me, I write it down um, and then I love when I'm pressured to change menus with um, Chris because that, may, that means I just have to sit there and I have to force myself to start thinking about food, especially for catering because that, you know, 
you know, you're blowing fuses everywhere and you 500 people and blah, blah, blah. But yet, it still has to be beautiful food like this. So, um, I mean, that's how I, that's, I just, cre I, I love, I love creating uh, menus. I love creating concepts. Um, but it didn't, it doesn't always come easy. So the, I think the more you read, you have to read a lot. Um, you know, then memories start coming back and you'll be like, oh, I remember a dish something like that. You know, but try and, try and read as many cookbooks as you can um, or magazines. Uh, too bad gourmet is gone, but I used to love my, when I got my gourmet in the mail. Anyway, that's the chauffeur. Okay. Um, what type of caviar do you use for this fish? This was the American sturgeon caviar. Paddlefish, American sturgeon. Did you like it? Yeah. I love caviar. I, I don't know. I was telling, what was I telling you last night? My new habit? Oh my God, it's very bad. <laughs> I, I ate two ounces of uh, caviar with like this little rye bread. We make rye rolls at Montan and you slice those thin and toast them with no butter. And then, then you take it off and you put the sweet butter on it and a lot of caviar. And, oh my God. I've, I've been doing that like for once a week now. I have to stop. It's expensive. It's too early. Too early. Yeah, put them back in the freezer for the, in the freezer. Okay. Do we have a freezer here? No, no. Um, this next dish is called, um, the prune stuffed gnocchi, which is kind of like my signature dish, or this is something I created. Uh, uh, I think it was back in 1999 or something. Um, Art Culinaire called. Do you know Art Culinaire? Do you know that magazine? Do you, yeah? OK. So um, they wanted me to come up with six gnocchi recipes. Um, and I had to do it in like two weeks. So again, you have to be forced to sort of start to think about uh, uh, what you would want. And you know, it's a, it's a magazine that's, your colleagues are in it, so you kind of want to be creative, and, but you don't want to be too crazy. So um, this dish is actually um, a potato dough with um, a little bit of flour. Uh, basically, the potatoes get riced, and um, I let them cool completely for all my uh, gnocchi dough, actually. I don't, yeah, I don't even need them. Okay. But that's good. Basically, you boil them in water. Um, in their Idaho potatoes, um, I boil them with a little bit of salt in the water, and once they're done, um, you know, fork tender, you, uh, you kind of, once you can handle them, you want to peel them and rice them right away. Everybody knows what a ricer is, right? D you sure? Okay. Because it's important you use a ricer, not a food mill. The food mill will make it gluey. It, it, the starches in the potato to glue it up. So you kind of really want a ricer and you really want them to be fluffy and cold. Um, and uh, you know, normally it's like ten potatoes, but you have the recipe in there. So, um, one egg. God, I can't even crack an egg. Jesus. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, Stanley. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. Um, my favorite type of food to cook at home for my family. Ah, veggies, salads, roasted carrots. I don't know why, but you know, it, it, it used to be chicken, but then I'm like, mm, just don't like just roasted chicken anymore. I need to have the poulet rouge chicken, the red feathered chickens that are like uh, grown. Um, uh, a little longer, they feed them a little longer, and this thing has thighs, and the meat in that thing is amazing. And I sort of do it like Le Mille Louis uh, Bistro in Paris, where you just baste it in duck fat, or, or in poultry fat, and then uh, 
you have a big salad with that, and then um, these like palms anna with tons of uh, chopped parsley and raw garlic. Oh my God, so good. Who travels? Who goes out to eat and travels? I know you're students, but you gotta try to save some money and, and go out to eat, okay? Like, uh, I mean, I would always, that, like I think I talked about food with my friends uh, or everybody I worked on the line with, that's all we did was talk about food, 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 wine, 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 you know, and I, if you're gonna be with people, you know, cook at home, I'm sure you guys cook in your, your dorms, do you? Yeah? No? Okay. Yeah, I used to throw dinner parties, and, you know, we would eat at midnight, but we drank a lot of wine, chit-chatted. So uh, basically, this is your dough. Uh, you can, if it's a little sticky, you don't want to have, you don't want to add too much flour to it because um, you don't want it to taste like flour. You really want to taste the potatoes. Um, that's that. I know I have a rolling pin. Yeah. Jeff, can you talk a little bit about the food costs and how you keep everything with nine different businesses kind of yeah. working properly as far as food costs? Uh, yes, food cost is so important because you'll lose your restaurant if you don't know it. Um, you need, what are you laughing at over there? What are you, seriously? We always have for cost control. It's no joke. I'm telling you, Nine Park, I had one chef and it was every, every month. He was $10,000 over. I'm like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Jesus. You know, and it's, it's like, I mean, he can cook. He's got a great personality, but I can't understand the $10,000 every month. I mean, it's, 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 we're going to tank. And, you know, I kind of like, I kind of like, like, let, let them try to figure it out. But after the third month, I'm like, I can't do this anymore. So this kind of three things. You got to look at waste. Where is it all going? Uh, your menu. You got to attack the menu and you need to attack the invoices. Every day you should look at your invoices um, because um, you know prices go up and down. Um, and you also need to see what's coming in the door and do you like it. Uh, so that's really important. Um, I mean, I didn't know anything. I, I did not have a business background, but I knew, uh, I knew, uh, the ba I knew how to cook, and I knew that food and beverage is what's gonna make your restaurant succeed. And then you have to watch your labor costs. Uh, so you have to be smart about a lot of that stuff. Uh, and and then when you design restaurants, it's really important to design them from whatever cuisine you're gonna do, like your menu. Uh, we, for my last three restaurants, I actually worked with um, a kitchen designer, which I'd never worked with before. And before, I had all my equipment was like from uh, companies. And then this time, I wanted it custom made because I didn't like the way the equipment fit. It never fit in uh, correctly, you know? Um, so you, I designed the menus first for Montan. And then I decided how many plates I'm going to need and how many, um, you know, so everything has, has a home. Everything has a home in that kitchen. So it's pretty amazing. If you ever come and visit, you should, you should check out the kitchen. Um, we have a Maltini stove, which I never had because uh, I couldn't afford it, you know, when you're first starting out. But it was the goal to work on a Maltini, so I got it. Um, and that piece of equipment is going to last for hundreds and hundreds of years. It, 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 they make it in France. They shipped it over, and it's an amazing stove, right? Um, so that's also important too. The menus, you don't ever have, oh, this was this was with his fault, was he had two, you know, I'm like, Jesus, so salt cod and codfish. So you have two proteins on one dish is already gonna kill you. Um, uh, you know, it's, you, especially for appetizers, like the cauliflower, the cauliflower chauffeur that you just had, is cauliflower, so you can use caviar. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna fit that into your cost. Um, what's your, what do you teach? What is your food cost usually for restaurants? Like, what do you think? No. <laughs> huh? We 
try to discuss different types of restaurants, higher and, and lower as well. Yep. Uh, basically, you know, 33 or below. For, for higher end or higher? Yeah. What's your, what's your cost? Uh, at, nine. at nine, usually 30. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at B&G, the cost is higher because it's seafood, all seafood. Um, but the labor's lower. Uh, you know, I mean, I get so much shit from having a $25 lobster roll, but it's a pound and a half of lobster. So, yeah. and you know, it's cooked. We cook it, but it's really good. Um, so, so this dough is, um, again, potato dough. Can everybody see? And um, you use the cutters. Oh my god, just drop one. I'm so fired. <laughs> uh, you can use this again one more time. Um, uh, this is prune filling, so it's basically prunes cooked in uh, uh, Vinsanto or Madeira if you can't find Vinsanto. Uh, you cook them to plump them up and then you just puree them in the blender. And it's nice to have a little pastry bag. You fold them over. And again, with pasta you want to be so gentle like really gentle. You don't want to smash it. Uh, then I take a smaller cutter just to trim them, to make them nice and even, and then it kind of guarantees you that they're going to be sealed. And then you flip them over. I remember when Tiffany Top Chef did this on, on TV. Oh my God, my friends called me. Suzanne Gowen called and said, oh, Tiffany Top Chef is doing your prune gnocchi on television. <laughs> Tiffany Top Chef. <laughs> uh, any questions on this one? God, you guys are so quiet, oh my God. Oh, for this one, um, so a truffle gnocchi, which is basically this dough um, uh, made into uh, little balls when I use a, a butter paddle, and it has uh, truffles in it, white, um, and that comes with lobster and peas and chives, and it's in a, like a heavy cream reduction. I did that, that, oh, I think I probably did a chestnut gnocchi as well. I don't know, I can't remember. Oh, I did caraway gnocchi with uh, chicken stew, like chicken and dumplings, but caraway gnocchi. I think I did a dry gnocchettini too, like a semolina dough. Ah, saffron, yes I did. Saffron gnocchettini with mussels and fennel cream and uh, black olive croutons for a little crunch. That was good. I think, I think, I think that's all I can remember. Um, so basically, this is your dough, this is your, this is your pasta. Um, you need to freeze this right away because it's a potato dough and it'll oxidize if you don't. So not only will it oxidize, but it'll get really soggy, you know? Who's ever made pasta? Wow, cool. Do you like it? Yeah? Do you make gnocchi? Do you cool your potatoes? Ah, yeah. try it. Works. Um, also for catering, catering company, um, you can use instant mashed potatoes, by the way. So the Hungry Jacks, you can reconstitute them and uh, make a dough as well with instant mashed potatoes. I use that a little bit in catering if I have to do gnocchi for 500. It's like, you know, I'll be here forever, rising potatoes, blah, blah, blah. The, the Italians use that. So when you see gnocchi in a case in Italy, I'm like, how do they keep them like, how does, what happens? How come they're not oxidizing? And then I figured it out. Ah, it's gotta be instant potatoes. So I started fooling around with the instant potatoes and it works and it tastes just like this. It also works for Palms Rubichon if you wanna, 
if you're in, if you are ever in a hurry, uh, top chefy kind of thing, you can use them too. Jeff, we have another question. What? What made you think about using a prune filling compared to maybe something else? Oh, um, well, I love prunes. Sometimes we need them in our diet. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Full of them today, Stanley. Uh, so I want, this is again, the F Italians would kill me because I'm, 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 I'm screwing up their recipes here, okay? I'm taking a gnocchi, I'm filling it with prunes, and I'm serving it with foie gras. They would never do that. Um, so that's why I filled it with prunes, because it's a savory dish. And um, this uh, dish, gets um, the sauce is equal parts foie gras and butter. So a pound of foie gras and a pound of butter mixed in the uh, Cuisinart. And then you put it through a tammy to sort of get the veins out, put it back in the fridge. So now you're going to make a burb, basically like a burb blanc. Um, uh, my reduction is shallots, Madeira, and some fresh thyme. And then I, I already cleared it uh, through a chinois. And you're going you're gonna to whisk in the butter. So that's that sauce. And then it gets seared foie on top with dried prunes and almonds for crunch. And that's why I make them into that shape. So it kind of, it, it holds the piece of seared foie, you know, it holds the prunes and, and it's good. Does it sound good to you? Yeah. Jeff, can you just talk a little bit about your, um, with Will you make all, that? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously I, I can't be in every restaurant every night or every day every night. I can't. I have a daughter too who's seven. My husband's going to kill me anyway. Um, I have uh, an executive chef, Colin Lynch, no relation. But he's been working with me for 11 years. He went to the CIA. He was a graduate of the CIA. And he used to come in with his parents to number nine all the time. And he wanted to eat. And, and then you know, when he graduated, he wanted to come and work for me. And I didn't have space for him at Nine Park. But I did have space for him at B&G Oysters. And he was a kid who just wanted to be at Nine Park. He loved B&G. And as soon as. The chef who was $10,000 as soon as that guy was gone, then uh, Colin came in and it, he started, he's been with me for what, 10 or 11 years? So he um, took over Nine Park for me as a, as a chef de cuisine as I was opening up B&G in the butcher shop and uh, at that time Plum Produce. I had a produce store as well. Um, so um, Colin and I, he was just a chef de cuisine there. Now he's executive chef of all nine restaurants. Um, so he and I work very closely together on all menus. Um, we also um, uh, work with our chefs. So you know we have chef de cuisines in most restaurants, um, pastry team, all of that. Uh, oh, uh, we over communicate by the way in restaurant world. We have um, we I have eight back of the house emails that I have to read every morning and eight front of the house emails that I have to write every morning. So our chefs and managers talk about the whole night and who came in and what happened and what dragged, what didn't, was it great, who had a heart attack. So I know everything that's going on in all the restaurants. Uh, you know, if a dishwasher broke down or there was a leak, I, I know it. Um, so that is also very important when you expand and you have a team. Um, I, you know, I finally have a chief operating officer. I didn't for a long time, and then I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I don't like to manage managers. Um, so um, we have a tactical meeting every Tuesday where we stand up for one hour. He's he was in the army, Desert Storm. So we um, we stand up and we talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly and we give ourselves one hour to hear the good, the bad, the ugly from each restaurant. And I have a meeting every Monday with my senior staff, and that's kind of like any decisions, bigger decisions that we need to make and, you know, and figure stuff out. And, and then that's, that's my staff meeting, and then we have the tactical on Tuesday. We have a lot of meetings, right? A lot of meetings. <laughs> but it works, and we're, you know, a consistent group. We, we're still running, you know, Nine restaurants in Boston, pretty good. 
Um, so I'm basically, I love foie gras. I don't know about anybody else, but I, I also love big pieces of it. Like Christmas Eve, I usually treat myself to a half a loaf of foie gras. You know. Think about wrapping presents. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, you like foie gras? That's good. You want to kind of get a nice crust on it. I'm turning it down a little bit. Um, and you want to do it, you want to do it in big pieces as well because if you had small little pieces, you know it's all fat, so it's just going to melt. So that's why I like to do it in large pieces. I'm going to let it rest. It's going to get nice. It'll be rare. You can add shallots and thyme and baste it if you want. I go with my gut instinct. I don't know about you, but women have good gut instincts, and I kind of went with that. Everybody said I was crazy when I took Nine Park. Um, it had no windows. Um, it was a shoe store, but I I knew that's where I want I wanted to be there. Uh, or I, I like when I started to design in my head that I was going to own a restaurant. I wanted to be in the back bay where Mario was, uh, where this private club was that I worked at. Um, you know, Back Bay, Beacon Hill. Like I knew the clientele I wanted to feed. Um, so when I found Park Nine Park, I was like, "Oh, well, how many square feet is it?" And they said three thousand. I said, "Great, that will work." I never even saw the inside of it. And then I got the landlord on the phone, and I signed my lease like the day I got married, or something like that. Uh, and that that was that was great. And I, you know, I never knew how to write a business plan, but I had a, I had a, look how much look look at what you have. You have all of this. You're learning so much. I didn't even know how to write a business plan. I owed the IRS seventy five thousand dollars. Oh my God! And I, you know, had an Isuzu Trooper that I won playing blackjack. I won eighteen hundred bucks playing blackjack. So, if you have a vision and you have the drive and you have the passion, then 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 go for it and be smart about it and be conservative. Like don't don't think you're going to go and set these huge uh, expectations. You know, start off slow and you can always grow into it. You know, I, I started with Nine Park. It was so I have 60 seats or 69, and then 30 in the cafe. Oh my God, I was crazy when I was younger. I had a lunch menu, a dining room menu, a cafe menu, a vegetarian menu, the cheese menu. Now, I look at that now and I go, What was I? What was I thinking? Right? And, and I drove my chefs crazy. We changed all the time. But that was me, young, wanting to have a lot of stuff going on, and then like. As soon as I started to uh, expand more, and we had to um, control more, then I started to like take those layers off, like an onion. You start to peel those layers back, and you start to sort of relax into who you are and what you want, and then you want to sort of perfect everything that you're learning now and that you've learned in your 20s. And then by the time you're 35, 38, you might. I hope you have your shit together and you know what you want. That's that's. You know, and then and then continue to go that route. Like continue your path, and don't let any uh, be, don't let anything else persuade you. Follow what you have inside. Seriously, I did. I knew I was going to own a restaurant. I knew I was going to be a chef. I didn't know I'd be this successful. I thought I'd have a sub shop. Honestly, I, I did. I thought I was going to have a steak steak and cheese joint or something. Maybe I will when I retire. <laughs> um, thanks, Chris. So. Uh, this sauce, I don't know if anybody has my cookbook, but this is the hardest sauce to ever make um, because it'll break um, if, you, if you heat it up too high. So you really just got to have to have it warm. Uh, and then once the gnocchis are floating, um, they're good to go. It takes like four minutes. Um, So this is an appetizer at Nine Park that has been on there basically since I opened, or since I created the dish, and I can't, I can't take it off. Has anybody had this dish ever? No? Bummer. <laughs> it's good. I bet your daughter's had it. 
Um, so the foie is, is resting, and I actually like to season it with uh, fleur de sel and pepper after I cook it. I'm, I'm just that person who I don't like seasoning my food and then putting it in a pan because I always feel like I'm burning the salt and pepper. So I let it, I, I cooked it, we're letting it rest, um, and then um, it should be perfect, yeah. Uh, and the crust is amazing. You have to have this, you should try this. Uh, toasted almonds that I, Amanda sliced or cut up. It's my best bud now, this one. We take our boxing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, can you talk a little bit about what you think about when you're designing a plate like that, um, as far as plating it? Again, uh, color, uh, texture. I like I like I like textures. I, I'm a very layered person. I got a lot of layers to me. I love texture. I love crunch. I love softness. Um, and I, uh, you know, that's when you when you create dishes, you sort of I create them in my head and then I'll write them down and then I'll draw it. I'll try to draw it so I can see because there's nothing worse than designing a menu and you start to cook the food and it's and it's like oh god I didn't know it was going to come out that color um, or you know the meat is too big or something takes over the plate. Um, so it's kind of nice to kind of go put it in your head a few times. Like, what do you want it to look like? What do you want it to taste like? How many, how many layers does it have? So that's the prune. Any questions? Of Johnson and Wales, I think. Wyatt. 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 Wyatt's my. He's Wyatt's in training now to be the chef of Maltong. Once uh, you know Colin has trained him enough, he's been with me for two and a half years. Um, he's a great chef, but he's not a really good leader yet. So you have to be a good leader. Um, you know, you have to really lead your team. The other thing we have every night too is um, after service, every one of my kitchens has a meeting. With the with the cooks, um, how do you how do you think you did today? What do you think you did? What, what could have you done better? Because there's nothing worse than having a shitty night, going home, going to, and you can't sleep because you're like, oh, I, I totally screwed up. So it's really good to like sort of talk about it at the end of the night, and then you kind of have a clear head on the next day. What do you want to work on? Do you want to get you know you want to be faster, you want to get better. That's the only way I or my team can find out what you need to succeed. I, if you don't talk about it. I, I can't give you the tools. I don't, I don't know. I mean, especially because I'm not in that restaurant all the time. So we, we actually want to set you up for success, not for failure. And that, when you're going to go out and look for a job, you want to find restaurants that want to set you up for success. And sh go higher. Go higher than you think you want. Like, who's going to go on a cruise ship next? Who's going to go and work on a cruise ship? Anybody? Nobody? No? How about a hotel? Uh, what do you guys? What are you gonna do when you get out of here? <laughs> for you, chef. You gotta come work for me. Yeah. All right. All right. Chef, what are some of the traits that you look for in, in someone to be a leader of your teams? Um. Yeah. My. I always call it like. Um, like, if I see you walking around with a clipboard, I'm gonna kill you because that's not. <laughs> That's not what we're about, you know. It's like roll up your sleeves, you know. You're, you know, peeling walnuts, crazy stuff. Like you're with them, um, and you're uh, a good listener, and you're tough, and you you also give a compliment when a compliment is needed, you know. And you want to be a great leader. You treat people the way you want to be treated. There's no screaming in my restaurants at all. I used to. And then I don't know what happened. I, it just doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't get you anywhere. Um, but um, treat people how you want to be treated, and you're going to get that respect right back. Um, also be fair. Uh, think of your employees. 
Uh, you know, I opened three restaurants in a recession. I didn't lay one person off, and I still continue to give raises when raises were due. I, I, I give my staff dental insurance. Who, what server gets dental insurance? What dishwasher gets dental insurance? Um, work for companies that like uh, are gonna are gonna help you succeed. Don't don't cut yourself too short. Okay, that's like when you leave here. Think about the cuisine you want to learn. Think about where you want to be in ten years and go for that. And and don't ever sell yourself short. You're already here. This is a good start. Oh God, I'm I'm looking for people who actually never worked in a restaurant before sometimes, so I can teach them. And I don't, I don't like them to have bad management skills um, from another restaurant. Uh, that's the beauty of having a lot of restaurants too, because you can hire within. And mine are all different. They're not all nine number nine parks. They're completely, have their own character. Um, I have to say my uh, wine director and I have worked together for, what, 25 years? So, um, I'm quite spoiled with Catherine Salieri, who was also like a self-taught, so she was a sommelier, and now she's my wine director. Um, and think how hard her job is, okay? Think about having to talk about Burgundy or Chablis every night to staff. But that's, my staff stays because of the wine knowledge they get. Um, we do wine words every night in one of our restaurants. She still, for the nine, lists that she has. It's only her and, and um, this other girl, Kate Smith, who went here as well, Johnson & Wales. She was on the line, she was on Gar Marger and I made that thing, she cried so many times. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> then she left and then she came back, but she wanted in front of the house. Um, but it's Kat Saleri and Kate Smith who were basically doing, um, no, uh, have, a, have a cup of cold water, uh, who do the wine program there. and. Um, that's wine words every night, um, plus pre-mail. We always talk about the food. Um, you know, I mean, we give them so much information. They, they leave you know, with journals by the time they leave the company. So that's really important. Yeah, you have to talk about it all the time. And taste. They taste once a bottle a night or whatever. But, and then we do blind tastes. You know, we'll co cover all the bottles, and then they have to tell us what grape it is. We have wine uh, makers come in all the time. You know, uh, John Trimbach comes in at least once every three months. Um, so they come and they talk about it and they talk about the soil. Also, Kat, when she travels, um, she writes it all down and, and she's a freak right now. She's talking about minerals all the time. Rocks and minerals, why soil's completely different. And she's in love with what she, you know, what she's finding out. So that's also great, you know. Um, so we give them that information. Um, is that, that good? Yeah? Awesome. So this next dish is a poulet en pan, which is a, another take on like um, a bread dough, but it's not, a, it's not like a bread dough. There's no yeast in it, so you don't have to worry about it at all. Um, it's basically um, flour, butter, a little sugar and salt, and uh, some water. Um, some water, and um, you uh, take a chicken. I actually take the whole wing off because when it's done, it's easier to slice. Otherwise, you're going to hit the bone, hit the hit the wings. Um, and you're going to stuff it with mirepoix, onion, celery, carrots. You can stuff it with whatever, whatever you want, basically. But I like the simple onion, celery, and carrots. When you eat this dish. Um, it's meant for like a picnic kind of thing. So if you're, if you know, like the hall, if you're coming and you have family coming, this is, you just start picking at it or you can slice it. It's never gonna look beautiful, but I did do this in Courchevel with my, with the girls. Uh, black truffles, all inside the, ch the chicken. Um, and uh, it, it was amazing. Um, and then I also did it with tiny uh, roasted potatoes mixed with rosemary, olive oil and salt, and, and then did these foil packages. So you got a poulet and pan and these beautiful roasted potatoes and rosemary. And then um, I also did um, a sauce uh, made with a, the liver, the neck, the wings. 
but also had vin juan, a wine that is almost oxidized, like, and, and that was the quick jus with that. It was really amazing. But this is the simple version. This is less, exp less you know, truffles. But, yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. Restaurant week? Yes, twice, right? March and August, yeah. Not Montan, though. Am I boring you guys yet? No? What's for lunch? Yeah. Oh, yeah? When you first started your first restaurant, yeah. did you have investors or partners that were in No partners. All you? No, I had investors. I had no money. Oh, I was lucky. I was like, wow, somebody's going to give me money for a restaurant? They're going to believe me? Oh my God, they're crazy. Um, no, I had to write a business plan and that, that, I had a vision and I had to sell the vision. You know how it's hard to sell a vision. And like, who was I? Um, but um, I got my, I got an angel investor, which is an angel investor is somebody who usually gives you like $25,000 or $50,000 to get you started. And then it's like a network, you know, they have friends who have money and then like to um, invest in restaurants. I need a little oil. Um, uh, so from that angel investor, um, I then started to get, um, I, you know, I did my homework. I had to go and find people who wanted to invest in restaurants, other restaurants. Um, so I have a, a, now I have like 14, 15 investors. The first group came, some of them have passed away, but you know, um, the first group, Stayed um, with number nine, B and G, butcher shop. You know, they added on. They continued, um, and then I got some new ones for the Congress Street project because uh, a lot of people thought I was crazy. And you're way too early. You're a pioneer. There's nothing down there. I was born down there. I know what's going to happen down there. I, I I know that area very well. And the building I'm in now, I knew as a little kid when my mother walked me down the street. Um, it you know I'd go right down A Street, and then there's my restaurants right now. Um, and it used to be old Boston costumes, so as a little kid I'd be like, oh, look at, you know, like Big Bird or whatever. But um, it's an old warehouse. It's an old um, wool warehouse. And out, down around that area, there's tons of wool warehouses. So um, that's how I, yeah. What's there? So it's 15, okay, so it's one big building. Um, that somebody, uh, a developer bought like seven years ago. Um, it's one long building and in that building I have three, rest three concepts. One is drink downstairs, which is the craft of the cocktail bar. And it's all about the ice at drink. We have ice uh, made for us in Gloucester, Massachusetts, into these 300 pound blocks, clear blue ice, glacier ice. And then they ship it to um, Somerville, and then they break it down into 30-pound blocks. So if you come in to drink, they're, they're chiseling away. Um, you know, you get the perfect rock. Like if you have scotch on the rock, it's got the perfect rock. Um, and then we have other ice, too. But it's all about ice and the craft of the cocktail. And I designed that bar with, I hate endorsing anybody's liquor bottles. So I don't have any bottles up here at all. It's punch bowls, it's vintage glassware. Um, we make all our own bitters, our, our tonic water. I mean, they're, they're crazy down there. But, and I also flip the bar. There's no back bar whatsoever. So all the uh, bar is in front. And so it's like, a, it's like you were a chef. Uh, you pull out your drawers, there's all your mise en place for your cocktails. Um, the back bar is all um, basically for chilled glassware. It's nothing like getting a cocktail with a warm glass, right? Uh, so that's, that's drink. And then upstairs is um, a restaurant called uh, Sportello, which is sort of my take. I used to work at Brigham's as a kid. Um, so it's counters. It's a counter service. Um, and it's Italian, modern, looks modern, but it still looks like a diner in a way. Um, and that's my Italian restaurant um, and bakery. We have a little bakery. And then next to that is um, Monton, my fine dining restaurant. 
And each restaurant has a different, has their own kitchen, their own finishing kitchen. And um, downstairs, I have a, one large kitchen that my catering company, we all work in. So it's, it's basically built like a hotel kitchen, but it's not a hotel kitchen. You know what I mean? But it's, it's, it's based on that. Like we have, I have a, a kitchen manager who, you know, checks in all the produce uh, and goes into their proper locations. I have a meat room. I have a fish room. So all fish gets butchered in the fish room. All meat gets butchered in the meat room. Um, it has a really big bakery. We have a chocolate room, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, so um, just let me finish this. I'm just showing you how to make, I, I, I made a quick sauce with this. So whatever chicken was left, I just, you know, caramelize it, get it nice um, and uh, caramelized. And then I just hit it with water and I had some mirepoix left over and I just made a quick jus. And that's, you can totally do that. Um, if you have mushrooms or whatever. Just wanted to show you, you can use everything on the bird. Where's my dough? Oh, sorry. So here's your, um, your bread dough. Thank you, chef. Some, go ahead. Uh, word of mouth. I never advertise still till this day. I hate it. Um, I don't hate it. I just don't do it. But now it's different. It's completely different now. Social media, tweeting, texting, all of that. You, you sort of have to do it. I, I'm not even on Facebook. I'm me personally. I, I'm not. But the restaurants are. Um, when I first opened, it was you know you. Uh, before I opened Nine Park, I I, I got a few awards from uh, Food and Wine Magazine, I got Best Chef, uh, you know, Rising Star Chef, um, Boston Magazine, I got a lot of press on that. So my, there was some accolades already happening, so I had a little bit of a name. Um, but no, I never advertise, and then you, you basically wait till you get a review, and the review um, can either make you or break you, I guess, sometimes. You know what I mean? So if you get two stars, or one, and you want three, then you gotta believe in your reviewer, Take it for what it is, and then fix it. Don't say that they're cuckoo or whatever, but take it. Take it in and take that criticism and grow from that. Um, so once you get press and really good press, you can, you know, other, other newspapers, uh, New York Times will grab it or Bon Appetit will grab it. So that's kind of how that works, that um, PR system, I think. Um, it, works, it works for me. Is that, any other questions? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Talk a little bit about the importance of food safety in your restaurant. We, I love to have a HACCP program. It's so hard to get um, somebody to come in and, and get us to be HACCP. I worked with the health department in my new restaurant. Um, okay, so I designed, what, uh, three kitchens. Uh, my grease trap is 10 feet below. Um, so once we laid the floor, I was screwed if I f***ed up anything, right? So and there's hand sinks everywhere. Um, and the health department signed off right away. They were like, woof, this is great. I was off by three inches um, in the butcher room, but just because it wasn't, wasn't our fault. But the hand sinks, the mop sinks, all of that um, was something I wanted to complete um, health with, with the health department. Um, all the restaurants. But Montan is like, should be the model of clean. I know I don't wear a hat, I'm sorry, but. Um. The other who asked that question is our food safety director. Okay. Keeps us all in line. Yeah. Doctor, what do you think about gloves? I hate them, but yeah. I, I, I don't know. I have a hard time with them. I like to feel the food. Um, I know I just made a mess here, but um, this chicken, this, basically, this is, this is it. So you just wrap your chicken and put it back in the fridge because there's a lot of butter in this dough, as you can see. Um, so you want to let it, um, 
you know, get nice and cold. Uh, then you're going to egg wash it. Uh, I, I like a little fleur de sel and some rosemary. If you don't have it, you don't need it. Then you bake it um, for about an hour and a half at 350, 375. And then let it come out and let it sit as long as it possibly can because it's still in there and it's still steaming. Um, and then um, you can. Uh, do you have a knife? I'm sorry? But the maripois, the maripois had salt and pepper in it. Uh, it wouldn't, but it would get wet. So if you salted it, the water starts to come out. Like basically, I had it wrapped in chicken. I mean, in a paper, in a towel, yeah. to stop. Like this one I made yesterday, um, it was a little wet, so the dough started to kind of break. Um, so this, you just follow sort of where the breastbone is. And you can, I don't know if you can see. Can you see? So it's, it's just a steamed chicken, basically. Um, and you know what it really tastes like? Pot pie, fancy pot pie. Want to try it? No? What? Oh, that's the last time I'm hanging out with you, Stan. God. I just, um, so you can see in the crust stays here. It's meant to be a fun picnic sort of thing or if you're just hanging around. This is actually the best seller at the butcher shop. We do more poulet and ponds than I could ever imagine. And it comes with potatoes. Um, all right, I'm gonna try it. Sorry, Stan. So that's that. What do you think? When you um, purchase your food from your vendors, do you look for, like, do you want very high quality, or do you shop around for your things? I totally shop around. Uh, at this point, I have um, Ralph, this other guy, Ralph. Ralph and Colin were, like, the two executive chefs when I had number nine, and then I split them up. So Ralph is basically a back-of-the-house sort of comptroller. So if I find something I like or a farm I like, I put him on it, and he goes and finds it and gets, it, gets me the information. He'll get me the price. We're extremely picky, yeah. I mean, you have to be. You're paying for it. If you're not, you, shame on you. And that's the other thing. Like, I, I, I was like, I want to be nice, but yet I also want to be a very strong businesswoman. You know, I don't want to be taken advantage of. So you want to know what's coming in, product-wise, everything. It's really important. I'm ta you're talking like pennies. It will kill you in the restaurant business. You have to be on top of it. Food cost is really important. Food, liquor, all of it. Paper, tablecloths, china, glassware, silverware, it all matters. Everything matters. What, uh, yeah. Yeah. what percentage of your food that you use is maybe local or sourced regionally or locally and would you like to see it higher than what you have? Oh. Yeah, I mean, we have problems here in the United States because you can, there's nobody here to slaughter anything, you know? Like, I can get as many animals as I want, but I think I have two slaughtering houses in New England, and they're actually called Blood Farm. Um, you know, so when I opened the butcher shop, I planned on having large animals, but they don't ship a whole cow anymore or half a cow, you know? So um, I use local as much as I can. Again, we're in New England, so the winters are really tough. Um, but I'm starting my own root cellars um, where you could take all the leaves that fall from the, in the fall, you dry them out, you have buckets, put rocks on the bottom, you have your carrots, pack them in with dry leaves. Put your potatoes, pack it in with dry leaves. And so those are my root cellars to try that. This is my first year trying that. Um, also working with my uh, state uh, to uh, have compo uh, recycling centers around where we are, and then having a compost station um, so that we can use and we can grow stuff um, ourselves. For, for huh? part of the community compost or for just your restaurants? Uh, community. Uh, I want to work in community. 
this, this doesn't benefit just me. It should right. benefit all, all the restaurants. It's really hard to recycle because nobody, there's no company that actually can come and pick it up. Um, and um, there's one, and we're working with that so far. But there should be more, or, you know, we should design a truck that actually takes the garbage, eats it, and then runs on it, just like your body. So we're working with that. We're trying to play around with those ideas, partly because my staff can't afford to live in Boston. So a lot of them live outside of Boston, and the trains stop at 1 o'clock in the morning. So if they're there at 1.30, then they have to take a taxi. This vehicle can actually help take them home as well, like as a carpool sort of system. Do you know, did I go too far with you? OK. Chef, where's your room cellar? Is it home, home issue? No, in my, my apartment. Yeah, it's just, just a, but I think it's a great idea, right? I think, why not? Um, but I learned the whole leaf trick from my farmers up in Vermont. I mean. <laughs> They know when they're going to open up their first jar of peaches, it's March 1st. They know they got like eight more, six more weeks and they're going to start planting again. But that's how they eat. You know, they're like, oh, it's March 1st. We get to open the peaches. It's because they saved all their peaches. Um, which leads me into this next dish about dehydrating. How many of you dehydrate? Um, I love dehydrating. I have, an, I have a lot of, I have a, I have a bunch of these at home as well. Uh, so when you have a garden and you have too many vegetables, you can just dehydrate. Um, put them in ball jars with a little bit of an oxygen pack, and all of a sudden, you know, I start to hear pop, 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 pop. All my jars are like, you know, sucking the air out. So dehydrated food could last you hundreds of years. It never goes bad as long as your moisture is out. Um, so this dish is just a take on. Um, a banana split, basically, uh, where I dehydrated some strawberries, some pineapple, and some bananas. Um, thanks. Uh, uh, we're going to heat the cream up. You can help me here. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to just heat the cream up and pour it over chocolate, 72% uh, uh, bitter, sweet. I think that's what we used. Yeah, dark chocolate. Um, also, we made walnut powder, which is basically walnuts dehydrated and then pulverized. Did you put them back in after that? Hmm? After you pulverize them, did you put them back in? No, I did use a little of the tapioca maltodextrin, oh, yeah. which binds fat. Yeah, so tapioca maltodextrin, which binds fat, he also used um, to hold this together. So basically, a, a chocolate ganache with dehydrated vegetables and whipped creme fraiche um, is going to be the banana split. I don't, I don't need to have, show you how to slice a banana and all that, right? <laughs> I feel like a... <laughs> um, and then I had extra strawberries left, so I just kind of put them in sugar yesterday, and I cooked them this morning just to get some of the syrup for um, this dish. It's hard to find good pastry chefs, actually. I don't know why. Like, they're all crazy. <laughs> I had one that used to use so much saran wrap, I was going to kill her. Kill her. It's like trying to unpackage stuff. It was like, took me a year. But she was good. You know who I love? Claudia Fleming. Do you know her, Claudia? Claudia Fleming. She was the pastry chef at uh, Gramercy Tavern when that started. Um, now I'm starting a new company. It's kind of, it's all about this stuff. Um, it's called Blink, Barbara Lynch Instant Nutrition Company. And um, it's um, making food products um, on the go. But it's basically all um, nutrition food. Um, and I'm starting a small manufacturing company in Boston. Um, uh, sort of a modern manufacturing plant is my next um, I guess phase of life, I guess. Do you take um, co op uh, internship students? All the time. At all the restaurants? Yeah, I have, yeah, I have cards. So if you leave, I have um, my HR uh, 
girls card if you anybody wants to do stages and you want to come and check it out um, both front of the house back of the house wine whatever we'll we'll come we'll talk to you um, I used to go to all the career uh, you know like at CIA I'd go up to the career career fair Vermont I'd go I, I don't know you have them here yeah, usually we'll send our staff out to go and meet you and talk to you but um, if if you want to see Boston it's so not not that far Come, come one day and hang out in the restaurants, but be prepared to work <laughs> all day, all night. Um, but we got a great, great team. So um, basically, that's the banana split. Um, so again, how easy was that, right? Cream and chocolate, dehydrated fruits, and creme fraiche. You don't. Oh, where's my own? Where's the powder? Whoops. Sorry. Powder. Um, we'll also give it um, a little more flavor. So that's that. Very good. Great, great. Thank you. Oh, you want me to come no, up here? Oh, sorry. Does anybody have any questions for before we finish off? No, we had enough. Um, personally, I thought it was an amazing, amazing time. And for you young girls in the audience who are going into this profession, you can see you can be very, very successful. Because yeah, sometimes the image of the profession is that it's, it's a man's world. And those days are long gone. We need more women in the kitchen. Uh, and you can do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I used to hate that question. What is, uh, how is it like to be a woman in the kitchen? I don't know. Uh, same as a man, but you know, it's, it is tougher. But um, it's the same. As long as you love what you do, it's, you can, you're going to be able to do it. Um, and business, too. I love business. I never did. I never thought I did, but now I love it. I never went into this profession thinking I'm going to make money, actually. It wasn't about money. It was about um, uh, what it, the instant gratification I can get when I can feed people. I get instant gratification if somebody likes something. If somebody doesn't, I'm like a, like a, like a freak. I'm like, oh my god, take it off the menu. Um, so it's all about how you want to feel for the rest of your life. What do you want to do? What do you want to accomplish? And 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 really do do what you really really want. And if if it's passion then go for it. If it's wine, go for it. If pa pastry, bread, go for it. But be the best you can do. Be, try and be the best. Because you, you have one life, and it's yours. Barbara, we've got a couple of gifts for you. Oh. We really appreciate you coming down and, and presenting to the students. I think it was tremendous. I think hopefully everybody realizes what an amazing lady uh, Barbara is. and. Uh, appreciate the hard work that she has put in to be as successful as she is. It's not easy, and I hope you realize that, but if you persevere and you're willing to work hard, you can be successful. Uh, Barbara, the first thing I'd like to do is just present you with this um, certificate, Johnson Wales University College of Culinary Arts. Be it known by those present, Barbara Lynch, chef owner, Barbara Lynch Grombo, is here presented to the Singers Visiting Chef Award for outstanding commitment and contribution to culinary education. And I'd like to present this to you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. And Stanley is going to present Woo. you with our 164th Distinguished yes. Visitor Chef Medal. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> Thank you. Barbara <Thank> <laughs> well, we now joins the rank of some of the most famous chefs in the world who oh. have actually come here and uh, presented to students over the last <laughs> many years, Stanley. Uh, oh, since 78. Yeah. 78. Uh, just so you should know, by the way, Stanley Neek is, um, was just for medal in starting this program in 1978. Um, so we've had 164 distinguished visiting chefs since then, and Stanley has been present for 162 of them. So he has assisted 162 distinguished visiting chefs. Stanley owns his own restaurant in, up near Worcester, Massachusetts. He built it himself. It's a castle. It's called a castle. It's a castle with a moat and a drawbridge. 
And wow. Stanley is 88 years old and still puts his uniform on and goes to work every day. So. <laughs> I love what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Far away, you know, he's been around, man. I, it's, so much, it's been fun hanging with him for two nights and just, you know, f who he worked with, who he knew. It's just, you know, that this, this is a small world in the food world. Um, so that's another reason you want to be amazing at it. Um, you have the opportunity. So b be great. Be great at whatever you do. It, it, sitting here talking to him was, I mean, you worked with Les Coffier chefs. You know, it's like, wow. I mean, when does that happen, right? It's great. It's awesome. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. hang around with you. A yeah. <laughs> She's going to do a stage <laughs> up in uh, Stanley's restaurant, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Barbara, I'd like to also present you with a, just oh. a little token for your kitchen wow. at home. And uh, it's a nice kit, and it says uh, for the kitchen of Barbara Lynch, the same as visiting chef. Oh my and, god, that's um, amazing. It's all fun that actually comes apart and watch it, but it's a nice little nice kit. So Thank you so much. Who makes that? Yeah. Do you guys make that? We um, are a supplier of that for the company that we work with. Cool. Wow. Wow. Awesome. So again, thank, thank you. Barbara thank for you. <laughs>